the F4U4 Corsair was revered as one of the most formidable fighter planes of World War II and beyond. It was a marvel of aeronautical engineering. With its distinctive wing design and powerful engine, it achieved a top speed of over 440 miles per hour. Pilots love its robust construction and survivability, which combined with its performance contributed to its legendary status in military and aviation history. That said, its incredible engine made the Corsair as feared as it was respected. We'll take you through the process the pilot had to go through to get a successful takeoff later in this film. My name's David Webb, and this is Blue Pawprint. The Corsair's fuselage was constructed of aluminum formers, intricately shaped for aerodynamic efficiency, and connected by longerons, which made for a lightweight and sturdy construction. Aluminum sheets, up to one-tenth of an inch or 2.5 millimeters thick, covered the frame, except for the control surfaces, which were covered in fabric. This made the Corsair strong and lightweight. The shape of the fuselage frame varied along its length. Forward of the cockpit, the frame was roughly oval, transitioning to a tear-shaped cross-section and then to a conical form towards the rear. The frame was divided into four main sections, engine, forward, middle, and rear. With a total length of 33 feet, eight inches, or 10.26 meters. A fireproof bulkhead was installed between the engine and the forward section. To maximize the efficiency of its powerful engine, the Corsair was equipped with a large propeller, which needed substantial clearance for takeoff and landing. Extra long wheel struts were considered as a solution. However, the Corsair's design got around this issue through its recognizable wing structure. The solution for the Corsair was adopting an inverted goal wing W-shaped design. The wing at the roots was angled downwards at minus 23 degrees. And then the outer folding wing sections were angled upwards at plus 8.5 degrees. This innovative wing design allowed for shorter landing gear, which also reduced drag at the junction of the wings and the airframe. But it was at the expense of added complexity in construction and increased weight. Despite these challenges, the overall design was remarkably sturdy and capable of withstanding maneuvers up to 11 G. Folding wings were essential for conserving space on an aircraft's carrier deck. The wing roots housed large intakes for the oil coolers and the engine supercharger, necessary for the efficient operation of the aircraft's powerful air-cooled engine at high speed and at high altitude. While functional for engine performance, these intakes produced a distinctive whistling sound at certain speeds, especially during dives leading some Japanese ground troops to famously nickname the Corsair, the Whistling Death. The center wing also contained landing gear wells and two hard points capable of carrying bombs up to 1,000 pounds or 454 kilograms each, or drop tanks. The folding sections of the wings had a metal skin on the forward part, extending from the leading edge to the main spar, while the area to the rear of the main spar was covered in fabric. Three 0 0.50 caliber Browning M2 machine guns were mounted near the root of each folding console. Under the wings, racks were installed for HVAR 5-inch unguided rockets accommodating four rockets per side. An essential aerodynamic feature was installing a six-inch stall strip on the leading edge of the outer right wing, just outboard of the gun ports. This small addition corrected an early design flaw 
where the Corsair's wings had different stall speeds, causing the aircraft to tilt or even crash during landing. For instrumentation, a pitot tube was installed near the tip of the left wing. And a gun camera was mounted in the right wing near the guns. The Corsair's control surfaces were intricately designed to enhance its maneuverability and performance. So the aircraft featured three section flaps, two parts on the center wing and the third on the folding section. These flaps could have a downward deflection of up to 50 degrees for landing, which allowed for slower airspeeds without stalling. Additionally, the flaps could be deployed to 20 degrees for tighter maneuvers at slow speeds. Despite the many advancements of the F4U4 model compared to its predecessors, the Corsair still had some handling issues. The powerful engine and large propeller generated considerable torque, which could cause the aircraft to tilt to one side if the throttle was suddenly increased. This was a significant concern during aborted landings or if there were engine problems during takeoff. Pilots were advised to be cautious with throttle changes in such situations. If not carefully managed, an excessive increase of power could lead to wing clipping or even a complete rollover. In earlier models, this torque effect contributed to the Corsair being nicknamed the Ensign Eliminator, as it was particularly dangerous for inexperienced pilots who could overreact to the aircraft's behavior. The Corsair was powered by the Pratt & Whitney R2800 18W Double Wasp, an air-cooled radial engine renowned for its robust performance. This engine featured two circles of nine specially arranged cylinders stacked one after the other, giving 18 cylinders in total. The engine displacement was 46 liters. The W in the engine's name signifies the presence of a water methanol injection system. This system was capable of temporarily boosting the engine's performance at the expense of a significantly reduced lifespan of the engine. Under this boost, the engine could achieve a power output of 2,450 horsepower or 1,830 kilowatts. However, this mode of operation known as Wartime Emergency Power, or WEP, was intended only for extreme circumstances. It could wear out the engine even when it was used for a very short period, drastically shortening the operational lifespan from hundreds of hours to a dozen minutes. During World War II, the average service life of a fighter engine was approximately two months of active duty, translating to around 50 hours of motor operation. The F4U4 was equipped with a four-bladed Hamilton standard hydromatic propeller, measuring 13 feet 2 inches in diameter, or a shade under 4 meters. This combination of the engine and propeller was integral to achieving the aircraft's maximum speed of 446 miles per hour, or 717 kilometers per hour, and a maximum climb rate of 4,360 feet per minute, or 22.1 meters per second. The Corsair's fuel system was designed with both capacity and versatility in mind, essential for its operational range in various mission scenarios. The main fuel tank was self-sealing, a critical feature for combat situations, and had a capacity of 233 US gallons or 872 liters. This self-sealing design was a two-layer system of rubber compounds encased in a metal outer shell. If the tank was punctured by a bullet, the inner sac would bulge under the force of the hit. The rubber around the newly created hole would then expand and close the leak, effectively self-sealing the tank in addition to the main tank, the Corsair was equipped to carry additional drop tanks under the center wing pylons. Each drop tank had a capacity of 150 gallons 
or 568 liters. The total volume of them both was even larger than the main tank. The fuel system was designed to supply the engine from any of the tanks, and notably, fuel from the drop tanks could be transferred into the main tank as needed. This flexibility in fuel management allowed for prolonged flight duration and operational adaptability. Without the drop tanks, the aircraft's maximum range was 1,156 miles, or 1,860 kilometers. With the drop tanks, the maximum range was considerably extended to 1,800 miles, or 2,890 kilometers. The Corsair's built-in armament consisted of six 0.50 caliber Browning machine guns. Underneath its wings was the option for eight 5-inch HVAR rockets in launch racks, and a combination of bombs, rockets, or drop tanks on the two underwing pylons. This flexibility meant that it could be equipped as a close support fighter bomber or a long-range fighter as needed. The maximum external load the aircraft could carry was 4,000 pounds or 1,816 kilograms. The standard armament Browning M2 air-cooled belt-fed machine guns with three in each wing was typical for American fighters of the era. These were effective against light enemy fighters. The two outermost machine guns on the Corsair held 375 rounds per barrel, while the remaining four had 400 rounds each. Gun convergence was usually set between 300 and 500 yards, depending upon the pilot's preference, enhancing accuracy in aerial engagements. They could fire between 750 to 850 rounds per minute at a muzzle velocity of up to 2,900 feet per second or 890 meters per second. The 650 grain or 42 gram bullets were effective in aerial combat up to 900 yards or 800 meters and could harm ground forces from an even greater distance. Each 5-inch high-velocity aircraft rocket, or HVAR, weighed around 134 pounds, or 61 kilos, and had a 7.5 pound, or 3.4 kilogram, warhead. These were used against relatively light ground targets. For heavily fortified targets, the Corsair could employ bombs of up to 1,000 pounds, or 454 kilograms. Alternatively, it could be equipped with two 11.75 inch or 298 millimeter tiny TIM rockets. Each one weighed 1,255 pounds or 569 kilograms and carried a 148.5 pound or 67.4 kilogram warhead. These air to ground rockets were carried on the underwing pylons in place of bombs and were effective up to 1,600 yards, or 1,460 meters. The cockpit of the Corsair featured a distinctively designed canopy with a slightly bulging midsection, and a Ford panel made of one and a half inch or 38 millimeter bulletproof glass, offering crucial protection while maintaining visibility. The pilot's seat was designed with safety in mind, featuring an armored backplate up to 0.5 inches or 12.7 millimeters thick. Inside the cabin, the left side console housed the oxygen controls, wing folding controls, the engine control unit, which combined the throttle and related controls. Further down was the hand pump lever for the hydraulic system. Also, on the left console was a sloped panel where the pilot could access the fuel, flaps, and landing gear controls. In front of the pilot were two armament switch boxes from which the array of weapons could be selected. On the main panel, there was navigational instruments, engine indicators, and fuel indicators. 
Below this panel was the central console. This included gun charge controls, oil cooling system controls and indicators, emergency landing gear release, hydraulic pressure gauge and fresh air control. On the right side console were controls for the electrical system and radio equipment. The rudder pedals, equipped with main wheel brakes, were positioned below the main panel and on either side of the central console. Directly in front of the pilot's seat was the control stick, which included a gun trigger switch, a bomb or drop tank release button, and a rocket launch thumb button. In front of the pilot was a simple Mark VIII reflector gun sight. Before starting the engine, the battery switch was turned on by the pilot. The fuel tank selector was set to on. And warning light bulbs were tested for functionality. The booster pump fuel switch was set to boost by the pilot. The ignition was turned to both and the engine started. The mixture control was moved from idle cutoff to rich. And the engine idled at 600 to 800 RPM until oil pressure normalized. The pilot would then very gently ease the throttle until the engine reached 1,000 RPM and the oil temperature reached 104 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius. During taxiing, the pilot used S-shaped plane movement as there was no visibility past the massive engine. The canopy was open and manually locked for takeoff. The tail wheel was locked and the rudder, elevator and aileron tab controls were set to counteract the engine's significant torque. To prepare for takeoff, the pilot would hold the brakes gradually increasing the throttle until the tail started to rise under the air draft from the propeller. As the plane accelerated, the pilot carefully monitored the airspeed, waiting for the indicator to reach over 81 miles per hour or 130 kilometers per hour, at which point it was time to gently pull the stick, guiding the aircraft into the air. After takeoff, manifold pressure was reduced, engine power was decreased, and the landing gear was retracted using the hydraulic system, incorporating the Corsair's unique gear design. The main wheel struts were designed to retract backwards, rotating 90 degrees during retraction. Before engaging in combat, the pilot turned the gun sight switch on move the gun charging handles from safe to the charge position and push them once. Each handle charged all three machine guns on one wing. The master armament switch and each gun switch were turned on. If the pilot intended to use rockets or drop bombs, the relevant switches were turned on to arm the bombs or ready the rocket launch circuits. The Mark 8 reflector gun sight was used for both ground attacks and aerial combat and often projected the target reticle directly onto the bulletproof frontal glass panel in the F4U4. To fire the guns, the pilot pressed the trigger on the control stick or pressed buttons on the same stick to launch rockets or drop bombs. More than 12,500 Corsairs of all modifications were produced, of which more than 2,300 were different variants of the F4U4. During World War II, Corsairs had a win-loss ratio with the enemy planes of 11.3 to 1. In the Korean War, Corsairs mostly served in a ground support role, but still scored many victories. The Corsair remained in production for over a decade, from 1942 to 1953, well into the jet age. It was a mainstay in the United States Air Force and then several other countries for over 30 years, showcasing its enduring utility and effectiveness as a military aircraft. 
If you like this video, please consider supporting us on our Patreon. If you spotted any errors, please let us know in the comments. We're looking to continuously improve. Thank you.